three, two, one. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Nós vamos, em alguns minutos, começar mais uma das atividades da SBQ. Você pode começar, né? Uhum. Good morning, everybody. Uh, initially, I want to... I would like to thank Professor Romeu Rocha, president of the Brazilian Chemical Society, for the honor to conduce today's work. It's really a great pleasure. Thank you, Professor Romeu. In this way, I'm very pleasure to introduce Professor Don Welton. Dr. Welton is professor of sustainable chemistry in the Department of Chemistry at Faculty of Natural Science at Imperial College, London, and is currently president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. His main research focus involved the structure and properties of ionic liquids to improve chemical process. All its scientific <clears throat> sorry, comments can be measured by its vast scientific publication and by the recognition of the community through several awards, include the Lo uh, Lloyd's London Personal Foundation Fellowships in 1993, the ACS New Voice in Chemistry in 2001, the Ingold Lectureships from the Royal Society in uh, 2007, uh, GFG Powiden Lecture for Liquid Ionics in 2011, the Royal Society Thomas Grant Lecture uh, in 2012, and more recently, the Daniel Lectures Royal Society Chemistry. Award in 2016. His career is amazing. He has a lot of uh, important discussions in the uh, liquid, ionic liquid area. And recently, he also published a nice review uh, in the Chemical Society Reviews from the Royal Society of Chemistry that I recommend for you have a more deep overview about his research. I hope everyone makes and enjoy most of these activities. I inform everyone who wanted to ask questions to write them in the chat. Please, in the end, I can read the question or give it directly to professor. Please, professor, it's really great to have you here with us. And thank you again to accept the invitation of our president. So thank you for that very kind invitation, introduction. And indeed, thank you to you for the invitation to come and speak with you today. Before I start my presentation, I'd just like to say that the RSC is very proud of its relations with um, SBQ. You know, we first signed an international cooperation agreement back in 2007, and that's been updated twice, most recently at the 2008 Team annual meeting. And this agreement has delivered support and services to members of both societies and improved the networking through scientific meetings, encouraging participants to establish new research collaborations, etc. And our cooperation is further increased, of course, um, since we have had an office in Sao Paulo. I'd like to offer congratulations to SBQ and, of course, to the whole country of Brazil on the occasion of the bicentenary 
of your independence. And so I'm very delighted to contribute today to one of the many events that will run as part of the post-22 chemistry movement in this very special year. Now, let me share my screen and start my presentation. There we go. So I'm going to talk to you today about chemistry for a sustainable world. And in 2004, I actually became the world's first professor of sustainable chemistry. And so, of course, one of the things that I most often get asked is, what is sustainable chemistry? And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. You know, where has it come from? Where's the history that led to what we today call sustainable chemistry. And in a little bit, I will contrast it to um, what we understand really as green chemistry. Um, although, of course, to say that both of these endeavors are equally important. So uh, this is not a new problem and chemical pollution has been around um, with us for as long as there's been a chemicals industry. And in fact, even before, you know, there are many uh, pre-existing industries that we would now say this is a chemical industry, although it didn't call itself that. And I'm showing you some pictures here of um, what it was like to be in cities, particularly in the north of England, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, these uh, large rapidly growing Victorian cities were really quite unpleasant to live in and very polluted and pestilent. And this led eventually to the first environmental legislation anywhere in the world, um, which was called the UK Town Improvement Clauses Act of 1847, which was then followed by the Alkali Act of 1863. And one of the things that we can do is we can look at um, reports from the time, we can look at debates that happened in our parliament, and these reforms were very widely opposed on the idea that it would lead to the destruction of the UK's chemical industries. So what was going on? So first of all, what is the um, industry that we're talking about? And so back then, the chemicals industry was essentially um, the production of soda ash, which, of course, was being used to produce um, soaps. I have to say, you know, soap was a revolutionary product and has saved more lives than probably every pharmaceutical that has ever been made put together. And so soap is a vital part of a sustainable future. And how was that done? Well, originally it was done by this, the LeBlanc process. And you start off with some sodium chloride, you react it with um, some sulfuric acid, that gives you some sodium sulfate, and particularly two moles of um, hydrogen chloride. You take the sodium sulfate, you heat it with calcium carbamate and some carbon, um, coke or coal, and that gives you the sodium carbonate that you want, plus some calcium sulfide and some carbon monoxide. And if you add all of that together, what you end up with is, and you can see the proportions I've put here on the slide, nearly twice as much waste by mass as you have made of the project that you, of the product that you desire. And particularly amongst these wastes, I'd like to point out the HCL. And if you look at the bottom of the picture, you can see um, a really quite, on the left of that, there's a, a, a picture of a very polluted environment where you can see the chimneys from factories belching out smoke. And below them, you can just about see the houses of the people that worked in those factories. And that smoke contained the HCL which then dropped down on as acid rain onto the houses surrounding uh, the factories. This made the workers unwell and uh, the factory uh, owners were, were not silly and they did not want that to happen. And so they did uh, the very sensible thing of building taller chimneys. 
Now, this picture is of a town called Witness, and the chemical industry in the UK very much started up in that part of the country. And what you need to know about the country is Witness is essentially on a small coast, coastal plain. Behind Witness, there are some hills which take you over to rural Cheshire, which is why you can see the picture of Downton Abbey. So the, now the taller ch chimneys um, were built with the prevailing winds that came from the west. That acid rain was no longer falling on the workers' houses, but it was falling on large agricultural estates. And I can't, sit, can't say too strongly, they were every bit as much an industry as the chemicals industry. They were the industry of agricultural production. And that acid rain led to widespread spread damage to the vegetation in that industry. And a conflict between two industries came about. So between the industry of agricultural production and the industry of soda ash, ash production. And the uh, residents of Downton Abbey had an advantage in that there was a Lord and the Lord was part of the UK House of Lords, which is part of our legislation. And so they could get to introduce legislation to oppose the um, pollution that um, was coming from the soda ash production. The legislation happened, that's the, 18, the 1847 legislation. And what this led to is something that we would call an, an end of pipe solution. The first move was to um, essentially pack the chimneys with straw, to wash water down them, and then the water would um, dissolve the HCL, the HCL wouldn't escape as acid rain. The problem with that was it wasn't very reliable and quite often the HCL would still escape. So what was the eventual solution? The eventual solution was this, it's the Solvay process for the production of soda ash. And now I won't go through the, the, you know, the, the details of the, um, of the process, but what you can see is the overall reaction produces far less waste. It still is a pretty much equivalent amount to the amount of, of product. But most importantly, that waste does not include HCL. And I'd like to uh, you know, point out, you know, if one thinks about the you know, 12 principles of green chemistry, so what have we done for the Solvay processes? We have added a toxic gas, ammonia. We have made more steps in the reaction. These are two things that you would not do if you were rigorously following the 12 principles of green chemistry. And yet the overall process is less polluting. It generates a less toxic byproduct. And actually, because you don't have all the problems around cleanup, it is more profitable. And the photograph that you can see here is a photograph from 2009, but the factory is still there, of a Solvay process factory still operating today. So therefore, it has sustained. It has continued on into the future. And so for, therefore, I would say this is a true example of sustainable chemistry. And really an example of regulation driven growth. Did we lead to the destruction of the UK chemicals industry? Well, clearly not because you've seen a picture of the factory, but also the UK alkali industry in 1862 employed not quite 20,000 people. In 2008, the RSC um, did a report on the UK chemicals and pharmaceuticals industry, which employed at that point 600,000 people. So actually what happened was not the destruction of the UK chemical industry, but a spurt of innovation that led to the UK chemicals industry that we see today. Now, one of the things that really until quite recently has been sort of accepted. When I was a student, um, people used to talk about infinite dilution. 
And the idea that, you know, the earth is a pretty big place. And on the whole, there's nothing that we can do to affect to affect it globally. And that, so therefore, pollution problems are local and they are short term. And here's an example of the kind of thing, again, when I was young, uh, that was a problem here in the UK. And that was the foaming of rivers and so regularly you get these pollution in incidents where rivers were just frothing up and foaming and this was caused by non-biodegradable detergents and here's a little bit of uh, the chemistry of that and so post-war modern detergents uh, were typically um, alkyl benzene sulfonates and the linear alkyl benzene sulfonates are biodegradable However, the branched alkyl benzene sulfonates are not. And that's what we were seeing. So it's not that the alkyl benzene sulfonates were the product itself, and we're seeing that. They were, if you like, a contaminant of the product. What was being attempted to be made was the linear alkyl benzene sulfonates, but that stream included in it the, um, the branched chain versions as well. And that's because the separation was not being achieved. And it was solved by this, by zeolites. So zeolites, molecular sieves, they, you know, they'd come about from essentially from the petrochemicals industry. And what it was found was that the five Angstrom zeolites could very, very selectively separate linear from branched um, alkanes in the region, you know, C10 to C14. That meant you could make the um, linear alkyl benzene sulfonates without the contamination of the branch chain. As soon as that could be done, that was done. And indeed, now in most parts of the world, it is regulated that um, detergent should be biodegradable. Okay, so when did this idea of infinite dilution start to disappear? And I think it was probably with this book. So this book is called The Silent Spring by Rachel Car Carson, and it was published in, first published in 1962. It's still published today. And what it really did do was point out that particularly certain pesticides and DDT in particular, can enter the food chain. And so therefore, people who have never been directly exposed or animals, that are, other animals that have never been directly exposed to the DDT can nonetheless be affected by it. And that that was leading to, you know, unforeseen consequences, the you know, massive loss of biodiversity because DDT is very unselective. And so therefore we were starting to get to this idea of longer term, indirect, more global effects coming from our activities. And of course, the thing that really, really um, showed this very well was um, in the 1980s, which was the discovery of the Antarctic, particularly Antarctic ozone holes, which was coming around from um, chlorofluorocarbons that were used in um, propellants for um, sprays and as refrigerants. And, you know, they had the advantage of being non-toxic and non-flammable, but they did, it turned out, lead to depletion of ozone in the stratosphere. And here's the chemistry of that. You have your uh, chlorof chlorofluorocarbon and photolytically you get some homolytic bond fission that generates a chlorine radical that can react with um, ozone, destroying the molecule of ozone, um, creating chlorine monoxide, which can then further react with ozone to regenerate the chlorine radical. And so the, chlor the, the chlorine persists and it is a catalyst. And so it just goes round and round the, the, the cycle. And so its impacts get magnified by that chemistry rather than being, di being uh, diminished by um, the environment. At 
turn led to the Montreal Protocol, um, uh, which was signed in 1987. And I think this is, you know, this is really interesting because it is, you know, a truly worldwide protocol. It addresses the problem clearly, but also it address the problem realistically. And so it's phased. And in its initial stages, the CFCs were being replaced, but they were being replaced by H HCFCs, which in turn are being replaced, and then HFCs. And so the, the available technology and the ability to deliver the necessary changes was staged whereas it could not have been done if just at the first stage, everybody had said, well, we have to stop this entirely. And so it was a very well-informed, sensible process. And of course, the other thing that's come to our attention over the last few years is just how much plastics are everywhere. And so this is a truly global problem. And let me give you an example. So the the little red dot on the map on the left-hand side is showing you where Henderson Island is. And Henderson Island is just about as far from any, you know, large centers of human population as you can get. And yet the photographs on the right-hand side of this are the beaches of Henderson Island. And so it's really showing you that plastics are everywhere. And what I'll show you um, later on is how that comes back, because plastics really are, a, you know, a major, major source of stuff around us. Another thing that was happening, um, uh, and the, the woman you can see in this photograph here is uh, Gro Brundtland, um, and she chaired the study that led to what is often called the Brundtland Report, which is this, Our Common Future, the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987. And it produced this really very elegant idea that sustainable development was development that could meet the needs of the present generation, but without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. As I say, it is, a sim it is simple and elegant and easy to grasp. So then, of course, a few years later, probably by the early 1990s, we started seeing people write in the chemical literature about sustainable chemistry and what it would be. And really what they were writing about was this, the implementation of that concept of sustainability in the chemicals industry. And perhaps not surprisingly, those early contributions mostly came from people who were working in industry. Whereas at the same time, we would see in academia, people tending to write more about green chemistry. And uh, here is the IUPAC definition of green chemistry. Now I've talked about the 12 principles of green chemistry. There are other ways in which you might describe it, but you know, this is the way that IUPAC, the people who define terms for us, choose to define it. And they talk about green chemistry as the invention, design and application of chemical products and processes to reduce or to eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. And so you see this is very much tied to the idea of whether a particular substance is or is not hazardous and about the elimination of those kinds of substances from the chemical products that we use and the chemical processes that we use to make them. But our sustainable chemists, we're talking about implementation of sustainability in the production and use of chemicals, which is, you know, I think you can see it's kind of not quite the same, necessarily the same thing. And also what started to emerge was this idea, which was that sustainable chemistry also included within it the application of chemistry and chemical products to enable sustainable development to occur. And given that really the people at risk 
um, from their environment are the world's poorest. And so that becomes bringing the benefits of modern chemistry and chemical products to all communities, but while conserving the environment. And so we now again have that link with sustainable development, economic development, and the environment. So oh, back to our sustainable development. And sorry, and the idea of compromising the um, ability of future generations to meet their needs. Now, this is, as, as I said, a very elegant idea, but is it as simple as you might think? So here's a photograph from 2005 um, taken at the Vatican City in Rome. Here is a photograph taken eight years later from almost exactly the same place. And of course, you can see very clearly the difference between them. Suddenly we have all these bright screens from our mobile devices. So here's a lovely infographic that I, I really like. And this is um, telling you about the huge number and range of elements that you find in a smartphone. You know, things like um, neodymium and, um, and terbium in, in magnets. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to is up here. Indium tin oxide. So indium tin oxide is the material that enables the screen to operate. It is transparent, so you can see through it and it can operate as a screen. But also it's electrically conducting. So you can touch, that's how you can touch the screen to give a command to the telephone. So you need to have both transparency and electrical conduction. Here I've got is a, for you a slightly unusual looking periodic table. This is the periodic table of scarcity that was developed by the European Chemical Society back in 2019, the International Year of the Periodic Table. And what it does is it tells us about the how much um, there is of different elements in the Earth's crust. The size of the element symbol is, or its box, is a representation of the amount of that element in the Earth's crust. It is, of course, a logarithmic scale, and so twice the size is 10 times the amount. And also it's colour coded. And the colour code is talking about how abundant that element is in comparison to how it is used by us. And so you have some like oxygen and sulfur, which are, you know, these are you know, truly abundant. Um, we have no real concern about um, their um, longevity. Then we start to see elements like lithium, which are yellow, which means there's some kind of limited available or maybe some future risk to, to supply. Um, and, you know, particularly with lithium, we think about batteries. And as we electri electrify our vehicle fleet more and more and more, and we make greater demand on lithium, we start to get concerns um, about the lithium supply. Then there are some which are colored amber. And here you can see things like those extremely useful catalytic um, metals like your ruthenium's and rhodiums and palladiums and the like where there is some kind of rising threat from um, our increased use of them. And finally, there are the ones that are colored red. And the ones colored red are under serious threat in the next century. So in our children's or certainly grandchildren's lifetimes, these are under serious threat. And where do we find tin and indium? So tin is yellow. Tin is also graded black, which means that it comes from conflict mi minerals, which means it comes from parts of the world which are politically unstable. And so there may be a risk to supply through that political instability as opposed to the actual amount um, uh, in, the, in the earth. But indium is red. So under serious threat in the next 100 years. <laughs> 
And so I would, you know, I would defy anybody in any audience to, you know, take their smartphone, to throw it on the ground and stamp on it. These have become vital for how we live our lives. So just in a very, very short period from, you know, 2005 to 2013, Indium has gone from being an element that you know, might have been of interest to a few inorganic chemists or maybe a few physical chemists, but it was not part of our everyday lives. And so our ability to supply our needs did not depend on it. Yet in just eight years, it was part of our everyday lives and our ability to deliver our needs depended on it. So there's a problem with predicting the future, which is you can't predict the future. And particularly, you cannot predict, predict what innovation is going to, to bring to you. You know, mobile phones have been amazing. So one of the big questions, again, 20 years ago that um, used to be asked a lot is, you know, how were you going to lay copper cables across the world in the way that they are laid you know, or were at that time laid here in the UK in order to enable telephones? Well, the answer is we're not. What we're going to do is use mobile devices, but that has had a knock-on effect on the sustainability of Indium. So how we talk about sustainable development has also developed over the intervening years. And uh, the way we talk about it now is very much around the concept of the sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them. Some of them are very obviously technical, affordable and clean energy. Some of them have technical elements, but not entirely technical. So zero hunger, for instance. And others are truly societal, gender equality, reduced inequalities, peace, justice, and strong institutions. However, what I would say to you is that all of these require either chemistry, chemical products, or the actions of chemical scientists in order to achieve them. And we'll have a little look at that as we go on. But actually, most of the time when I talk to people who aren't chemists, and even a lot of the time when I talk to people who are chemists, this is the only one of the sustainable development goals that is talked about. So that's goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. And we can see the link to that, can't we, in that definition of sustainable chemistry being uh, the application of sustainability in the production and use of chemical products. That would sit here in responsible consumption and production. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. And so underneath all of these goals, there are targets. And here I've pulled out the three which are most relevant to sustainable chemistry and target to 12.2 by 2030, which is not very far along now, to achieve the sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources. Target 12.5 by 2030 to substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling and reuse. In essence, that's referring now to what we would call the circular economy. But I've highlighted in red target 12.4 because it was supposed to be achieved by 2020. And it was to achieve the environmentally sound management of chemicals and all waste throughout their life cycle in accordance with agreed international frameworks and to significantly reduce their release to air, water, soil in order to minimize their adverse impacts on human health and the environment, that was quite a lot. And we have not achieved that. We haven't even achieved the 
suite of international frameworks that would be required to already be in place in order to achieve environmentally sound manage management of chemicals and wastes. And we haven't even got a mechanism yet for the appropriate science advice to be given to the policymakers to either develop those policies, those international frameworks, or to deliver those international frameworks. So there is some good news here in some sense, which is that next month um, there is to be a meeting of the United Nations Environment Agency at which there will be a proposal um, put forward to, um, to introduce an international intergovernmental panel for chemicals, waste and pollution in the environment. So that would be a body that is equivalent to the IPCC and to IPBES, which you may be familiar with, that um, would be able to provide the sound science policy interface that would be required in order to um, deliver this target. What I can say is, yeah, if you Google it, you'll find that, you know, as individuals, there is a campaign by the IPCP um, who, um, you, that you can sign up to as an ind individual to um, show your support for this proposal. But even with that, you know, what that in itself will not solve the problem, will not deliver this target. It is a necessary precursor to being able to deliver this target. And so, great, but we are way, way, way behind anywhere that we um, need to be in order to deliver this sustainable development goal by 2030. Okay, so back to our definitions. And so the OECD has a definition of sustainable chemistry and it's in two parts. The first part is this, sustainable chemistry seeks to improve the efficiency with which natural resources are used to meet human needs for chemical products and services. And so you see how those two different, those two definitions of green chemistry, it's emphasis on hazardous substances and uh, sustainable uh, chemistry, it's emphasis on resource efficiency are complementary, but not the same. And so we have sustainable chemistry efficiency, um, green chemistry hazard, and of course, sustainable chemistry is going to encompass the design and manufacture and use of um, efficient, effective, safe, and more environmentally benign chemical products and processes. So it is in there a bit, but there's a very different emphasis. And also within that OECD definition, we have the idea that sustainable chemistry is chemistry that stimulates innovation to give new chemicals, production processes, and of course, uh, means of product stewardship. And so again, you have that double um, definition of implementing sustainability within the production and use of chemicals and chemical products, together with using chemistry to enable sustainable development to occur. So here we go back to the um, uh, sustainable development goals. And what I would therefore say is that, you know, perhaps today we would say sustainable chemistry is the application of chemistry and chemical products to achieve all of the sustainable development goals. Let me just jump over that. So a little bit about the economics of the situation. So it's been implied so far, but I think it's, it's, it's worth me saying a little bit more about it. And so this survey 
I'm pretty sure this survey was done by Unilever. It may have been done by Procter & Gamble or one of the other big um, domestic product suppliers. And it was done back at the beginning of the century. And it, there was a, they did a survey, you know, fill out a form of um, consumers and asked those consumers whether they would be willing to pay a premium for a green product. And 50% of their respondents said that they would. And then they used their store cards to follow their shopping behavior. Only 6% of them did. So as much as you and I consumers may say, I'm happy to pay more for a green product, we're not. And so there won't be a consumer-led green revolution um, in this area. What we need is for those products to be commercially sustainable. And that means two things. The first is they have to be sold at a price that you and I are willing to pay. And that price has to be a price that the producers can make a profit from. Because either if the former doesn't happen, we won't buy them and the, and the, the products will leave the shelves and that's the end of that. They will not sustain, they will not continue into the future. And if a profit doesn't get made from them, then the producers will stop putting them on the shelves because they're not making a profit anymore. And so the product will not sustain into the future. So it's only by that commercial application that actually have any impact on the environment at all, positive or negative. So for the final part of my talk, um, we are, of course, at a moment of great change. Whether the rate is as high as some people might wish or not, we are going through the phase of the decarbonization of our transport infrastructures. So we are in the next decades going to reduce the requirement of petrochemicals for fuel. But actually, most of our chemical product, our carbon based chemical products, can really be thought of as a byproduct of that petrochemical fuel industry. And all of the chemicals mass is probably about 5% of roughly of the amount of material that gets generated by uh, an oil refinery. And so as we move away from uh, carbon-based fuels, those oil refineries are not uh, uh, an economically efficient way of making carbon for our other products. And so we need to rethink where we are going to get our carbon from. And of course, this has been talked about in terms of biofuels. And of course, there in Brazil, the use of sugarcane um, uh, as a way of generating bioethanol is probably the most advanced um, bioethanol industry in the world. But I'm not focusing on the fuels, I'm focusing on those other products. And so we need in the integrated biorefinery to be able to make our products um, from biomass. And so we need to reinvent our chemicals industry. Now, so what are we making? What are we making today from those petrochemicals? So this pie chart tells you all of the stuff that comes out of a, a, a oil refinery that is not fuel and what it is used for. And you can see that, you know, tiny little bits, 1% for pharma, um, less than 1% for 
pesticides. Only 4% end up as bulk organics. Fine chemicals, 16%. Of course, that's where things like our detergents that I talked about earlier will find themselves in that, in that sector. But 80% of what we make is plastics. And so that is a huge, huge, huge challenge for us. We are going to have to completely rethink how we produce, use, reuse, recycle our plastics. And so what do we need to do? What is the synthetic challenge? The straightforward synthetic challenge is, well, there are some things in that pie chart, not just the plastics, that actually we want the same material that we are using today. The material is perfect for the job. And, you know, that might be, for instance, in pharmaceuticals. You know, you can um, you don't want to take something that's a little bit like the, the pill that the doctor prescribed for you. You want to take the pill the doctor prescribed for you. Well, for other things, we want to make materials that have the properties of ones that we have today, but we don't really care what they're made out of. You know, I do not care what my uh, water bottle is made out of. I just want it to be able to hold water. And so it can be made out of a different material from the one that it's made out of today. And of course, what will happen as we, you know, always as when, when clever chemists start seeing what they can make from things, um, when we start seeing everything that we can make from this bio-based materials, we will actually make new materials that have properties that aren't currently available. And we don't at the moment know that we want, but once we find them, we'll think like, these are fantastic. So we have these three challenges. But in order to deliver these challenges in a sustainable way, we absolutely need to measure analytical chemistry, <laughs> understand the impacts of these new products throughout their life cycle. So that's in production, in use, while they're within the circular economy, we need to make materials that are designed to fit into the circular economy. And then of course, when they eventually do come to the end of their life, how they can be recovered, um, uh, or at least, at the very least, disposed of in a way that is responsible. We need to understand and control degradation. Part of the solutions, and it will be to, in some cases for biodegradable products. And of course, that's one of the things that we have to decide. When do I want a highly resilient material so that can go round the circular economy several times? And when do I want a biodegradable material so it, it biodegrades to harmless um, compounds in the environment? And that means you have to really understand and be able to control the biodegradation. So for instance, there are, you know, the paint on my wall here um, is, you know, have stuck the color stuck to the wall by polymers. You know, I do not want this polymer to biodegrade uncontrollably whilst it's on my wall. But when I strip the paint off, maybe biodegradation is a route for it that I would want. And of course, all the processes for making these new materials need to be sustainable. So there is a huge, huge, huge synthetic chemist challenge before us. And so I will leave you with this picture. Um, yes, sustainable development is the application of chemistry and chemical products to achieve the sustainable development goals across the whole of this range. As I said before, chemistry has a huge contribution to make and we as chemical scientists have a huge contribution to make. And so with that, I would just like to say thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen and ask you if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Welton, for this amazing conference. We have some questions already going, coming. Uh, just a second, Henrique Coutinho, and he asked you, 
uh, are conditioned pol polymers an alternative for idium thin oxide in touch screen? You have in the shot the question. So yes, I mean, it's, in, it's one of the, so at one point I'm criticizing polymers, <laughs> as it were, but yeah, so exactly. So conducting polymers are, have real potential to be in that screen. But what I think we have to think about, and this is, and there is, you know, our friends, the engineers do think about this, is the design of products so that they can, can be easily, if you like, deconstructed after use and the materials within them recovered and reused, recycled. And so, yes, I can imagine that the solution will to, to the screen will be a polymer solution, but we need to ensure that we can get those polymers back at the end of use and, as I say, either reuse them or recycle them. Okay, we have another one. It's from Dr. Pilon. How the biodiversity can, can contribute to speed up the sustainable challenger? You have oh. also the question. How the biodiversity, the biodiversity can contribute to speed up the sustainable change? Do you have an idea about products from the biodiversity can help? Oh, I see, yes. So, of course, so one of the things that you do, I mean, of course, you're, you, have a, you have a way of, being at least carbon neutral when using uh, biomass as the source of your carbon, because you're not using fossilized carbon, you're using carbon that has been sequestered from the atmosphere recently. Um, and so you can at least turn it into a zero sum game. There is no reason why a bio derived compound has to be, for instance, less toxic than some petrochemical compounds. Mm -hmm. You know, the, yeah, I think ricin is natural, and ricin is, <laughs> the most toxic thing, is the most toxic thing we know. Uh, but of course, what you have is the choice. You're not relying, you know, when we use our petrochemicals, we are relying on choices that were made by people over a hundred years ago. When they, you know, they didn't, I'm, I'm going to say they didn't care about the environment. They didn't know about the problems they might cause in the environment. But since we have to make the change to this different source of carbon, we have the opportunity to make choices that will mean that we will select from the various different possibilities that will emerge those which are most um, sustainable in the environment. Great. I have one from, from my side because... You really show us the, the necessity to, to have uh, products that you can pay for this, to, to don't use the, the uh, toxic products. But my question is now from the political side. For example, uh, we live in a country where the, the president don't think the environmental is a priority, for example. Yeah, yeah. But it's not only in Brazil. You have several countries that a significant portion of the society without understanding the importance from to stop to cut the trees all the time or to don't use uh, uh, products that can be not friendly for the environmental. As the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry, do you believe that you can organize or start to think in a way for this, the, do more pressure in the politics? Do, do, not, do you believe that you have any chance to do something like that? So, I mean, so the short answer is yes. So, but let me answer, you know, the long answer. The, you know, one of the things we might be able to do, and of course this is interesting in the energy transition. So now, Wind energy is one of the cheapest forms of energy there is. And so the simple economic drive to the cheapest will drive us in that direction. And so one of the things we might manage to do is not make the green product more expensive. We might manage to make it cheaper. In which mm -hmm. case that would, you know, some people, that would be the thing that will drive them. And so we really do have to keep our eye on that as something that we want to achieve as part of our sustainability is actually making the green product cheaper. Fortunately, here at the, in, in the UK, the RSC has 
good relations with our government. And, and indeed, you know, I was telling you about the proposal at the um, UNEA in February. Yeah. Our government is one, of, is one of the co-sponsors of it, and largely from discussions with us at the RSC. And so I think the thing there, what, how has that come about? Well, that's come about by persistence. You know, we have always been there. We are always trying to say to them, here is something that we can do to help you. Here is a way we can help you. And that builds good relations. And then that enables a better discussion. No, you know, nothing's perfect. You can always have better relations and you can always have better influence. And of course, there is the educational uh, thing, thing as well. You know, we do, again, persistently, we have to be persistent. We have to, all of us, take every opportunity that there is to educate those around us and i you know i i use the i use the example of the the pandemic and so um you know many of my neighbors many more now than at the beginning of the of the pandemic knew that i was a scientist and so they asked me for immediately they started asking me about you know the pandemic about viruses about vaccines about and you know, often I am stopped in the local market to find myself having a scientific discussion where I'm explaining something to people. And so even on that very personal level, every single one of us can spread the word. And our organizations, again, you know, be, I mean, by definition, you're on this call, so you're part of the organization. <laughs> so, you know, so be part of the organizations that can make those change. Yeah, I really believe in that education is a point that you need to, to think more all the time. And also, I think our researchers must look more for kids to yeah, improve yeah. the discussion about the environmental. Because with some old guys, I really do not believe that we can move too much at this time. But the, the kids, I, I think it's a way for us to, to go a little more, more deep. Yeah. Uh, and they say, don't be disheartened. You know, the, the political world swings. We know that, you know, we're now mm -hmm. old enough that we've seen, oh, I think everything's going wonderfully. Oh, my God, I think it's going horribly. You know, it's swing. And, and if you're in one of the back swings, don't get disheartened. Keep at it because the front swing will come back because it always does. Yeah, it's, it's true. Our president sometimes say this for for us in the, the Brazilian Chemical Society. It's a bad time, but it's going. It's not forever. Yeah, yeah. I remember one of the, the discussions that Omil used this expression. And it's the same thing. You need to keep making pressure for the government and the, the people to, to educate and to, to think more about the planet because it's... And in your, your talk was really amazing this way. Uh, I think our, our president has an, an observation for you in the chat. You can read or I can read for you. Uh, thank you, first of the excellent webinar. Considering the challenges such as that posed by Commercial Sustainable and others, do you think that 2030 it's realistic target to truly act in the SDGs? Do you believe? Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I think we... I, th I think we've already we've already missed the things that we would be having to already have done to achieve those sustainable development goals. We've missed, so we need to we need to somehow reset. And you know, and this is a very complicated discuss. You know, it, it's not just chemists who will contribute to this discussion it will be sociologists it will be all sorts of different people you know do we just keep the sustainable development goals we've got and say we need to change the date and accept that we're doing it more slowly or do we need to reformulate them in some kind of way which might be more achievable i don't know what the answer to that is but that discussion has to happen sure Okay, I think you don't have more questions. Uh, okay, you have. Does the UK recover all the metals present? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Our, ele our electronic waste is 
awful. It gets exported um, to, you know, countries in West Africa and the like, where it is badly treated. No, the UK, the, one of the things the UK absolutely does need to do is start taking responsibility for its own waste. Yeah, that's but I think that's true of any advanced economy. You know, what we have historically done is export our waste. And what we continue to do is to export our waste. Okay, Tom, I think we don't have more questions. Thank you so much for your time today with us. I believe that the people here learn a lot of the, your research and your provocations about the importance to, to take care of this subject. And it was really a great pleasure for me to be here with you. Thank you for the Royal Society, the Brazilian Chemical Society to uh, support this webinar. And if you have some final words, well, just to say thank you for the kind invitation uh, to come and give the talk. I, you know, <laughs> I would very much have preferred to be doing it in person and perhaps it won't be too long until that can happen. But apart from that, I think just farewell from my kitchen and <laughs> hopefully at one of your congresses, I'll get to come in real life. Sure, sure. It's, it's a great pleasure to have you sometime with us in Brazil. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. Bye okay. then. Bye-bye.